All right, I have one o'clock on the dot. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Adam Ketchmarchi. I'm the Executive Director of the National Drowning Prevention Alliance. Um, excited to have you here for today's webinar. Um, it's gonna focus on a discussion around water safety and drowning prevention for individuals with disabilities and autism. We're so honored to be joined um, by NDPA partner, Swim Angelfish, and by one of our new advisory council members to the NDPA. During today's discussion, attendees can interact with the presenters by using the chat function um, or the question and answer function. While the presentation's going on, I will be monitoring the discussion um, through the chat function and the question and answer um, function. And then any time that we have left at the end of the presentation, um, I'll pose any questions to our panelists. We'll get to as many as possible before our two o'clock cutoff time. Um, today's webinar is being recorded. So if by any chance you have to step off of today's webinar um, to go back to work or do something important for drowning prevention and water safety, um, the webinar recording will be live on ndpa.org um, by Friday afternoon. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and individually introduce all three presenters and hand it off to them. Uh, first off, we have Aileen Tesser joining us. Um, Aileen is an MAPT and is an NDT and Play Project Certified Pediatric Physical Therapist with 20 plus years experience treating a variety of diagnoses, both in and out of the water. We're so happy to also be joined by Cindy Friedman with Swim Angelfish. Cindy is an M-O-T-R-C-T-R-S and is a pediatric occupational and recreational therapist with 20 plus years of experience um, treating a variety of diagnoses um, with a specialty in INPP reflux repattering and hol Holowick certified. Um, and then finally, we also have uh, one of our new NDK advisory council members, Dr. Andrea Taliaferro joining us. Dr. Taliaferro joined the coaching and teaching studies faculty in the College of Physical Activity and Sports Sciences at West Virginia University in the fall of 2010. Dr. Talia Farrow earned her PhD in 2010 and Master's of Education in 2002 from the University of Virginia in the area of adapted physical education. She also holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in kinesiology with a concentration in physical education from James Madison University. Dr. Talia Farrow uh, has also joined the NDPA Advisory Council as our um, autism and disability specialist. So welcome to all three of you. and. I will step off camera and off the audio and hand it over uh, into your capable hands. Hey, thank you, Adam. I'm gonna queue up the PowerPoint here. So if you could just give me one second, I will share my screen with everybody and then we'll get started. Thank you for joining us today. At least I'm trying to share my screen. Doesn't seem to want to. <laughs> and I froze. Huh, having a hard time in right here, but I'll hope my computer kicks in. I'm, I'm working on it. Okay, no okay. problem. I got no problem. I'll I'll report. Report. It's not letting me share. Sorry, I have another computer set up in the background just in case. Okay, let's try that again. Adam, I apologize, but it's not letting me share. So let me see if I can log on on another computer. I can, um, I can, um, I'm um, just talk a little bit about the statistics of drowning for swimmers, for swimmers and other types of drowning. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? We're getting an echo We're getting somewhere. An echo somewhere. Okay, how's that? I think that's better. Um, Andrea just muted hers. So basically, um, this is such an important topic for us to be discussing today because drowning is the leading cause of death for this population of swimmers, for swimmers with autism. And the reason that is so is because of the impulsivity that these 
children have the poor safety awareness, the poor body control, and because so many of these children are bolters and are fearless. So they're drawn to the water and they're interested in the water, yet they're not independent in the water. So Cindy and I of, of Swimming Angel Fish are going to share with you some of our strategies. Our strategies. Helping, on helping swimmers with autism to overcome some of the roadblocks that we have found to be very prevalent and big obstacles for these swimmers. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Andrea so she can um, share her screen and I will um, follow along with the presentation and welcome any questions that we're gonna to get to at the end of the presentation. Still working on it. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, here we go. Yay. So yes, the title is Water Safety and Drowning Prevention for Individuals with Disabilities and Autism. We've already had our introductions and these are the topics that we're gonna cover in this webinar. We're gonna overview, overview of the roadblocks for teaching swimming. And in our program, Swim Angel Fish, we've identified 14 universal roadblocks that are really powerful um, in order to overcome and then to go back and get these swimmers safe and independent in the water. We're gonna talk about the three that we feel are the biggest impact in drowning prevention. We're gonna share some resources with you, webinars, and give you tons of information that you can look at at a later date. And then Andrea is gonna discuss tips from pr practitioners and professionals that we polled at the NDPA conference that was just in New Orleans. And we're gonna share what everybody in the field is doing and having success with. And I just wanted to um, clarify for everybody that's, thank you so much for joining the webinar. Sometimes kids or adults with autism are very attracted to the water and they seek it with disregard for safety. And then some people, with autism will be extremely fearful and are un unaware of what to do when gravity is taken away and they enter the water. So there's kind of like, if you think of it as two different types of, of kids or adults that happen to have autism or sensory issues or general discomfort. And it's either, a lot of times we see anyway, we only do private and semi-private adapted swim lessons. They're either really drawn to the water or there's a, a, an intense fear and anxiety and trying to teach them how to overcome those roadblocks in the unlikely event that they were to fall into a pool, a lake or a body of water so that they would at least be comfortable to do some kind of self-rescue. Great, great point. So this is just some of the statistics of the research that's out there. So you see how factual this is. And like we discussed, the associated behaviors that Cindy mentioned are the wandering, the impulsivity, the love of water, or the other extreme, the anxiety and the fear of being near water so that if they did accidentally fall in, they'd panic and go into fight and flight and not know what to do. We love acronyms and we use swim whisperers as our methodology and our acronym to address the 14 most commonly seen roadblocks that swimmers with motor issues, um, discomfort, anxiety, physical disabilities, autism, sensory issues, or even trauma might have when learning to swim. The ones that we're gonna to discuss today that we feel are gonna be the most powerful are S for safety concerns, I for I can't touch that, not wanting to hold on to any equipment or even be touched, and then M, making a child go under successfully. So yeah, it's gonna be safety, going under successfully, and I can't touch that. So one, one of the first things, and Aileen and I will probably pop back and forth, but if, if you think of just general safety, a good strategy to educate parents, caregivers, 
anybody that's working with a swimmer with autism is to make sure that they ask before they enter basically any body of water. So it can even, so for some of our kids that really seek water, we have the parents ask before they get into the bathtub and just get in the habit of tap a shoulder and either gesture, vocalize, or verbalize to get into that body of water so that it becomes such a ritual and routine around lake, ocean, pool, fountains for that matter, that you are used to saying, oh wait, there's water, I have to ask somebody to get in. So in the unlikely event that they wandered away, they might be looking for somebody to ask if they can get in. And this, the safety with this goes to stories of parents that we have, even I have a parent who is in uh, New York City and the sound of the water in a fountain and the water going on his body wiggled out of his hand and she turned around and he was laying in the fountain just getting that water on his body. So the safety, one tip is just to ask. Always figure out some kind of a routine for asking before you even get into bathtub, pool, lake, if you're going to a, a zoo or something that has water, just really making that a powerful ritual and routine that there's some method of asking. Aileen, would you like to go next? Yeah. yeah. The next safety tip that we want to give you is just that, as Cindy said, a ritual and routine around water so that this child knows every time I get in the pool, I swim to the side. I don't grab my instructor's neck. I make a choo-choo to the shallow where I can stand, and then I stand on the step. So a little safety ritual and routine that you might do at the start of the lesson is, one, ask if you can get in, two, jump in with the instructor, three, swim to the side and make a train down to the shallow and then safely stand in the shallow. And, you know, it sounds so simple, but um, we've met children that were so impulsive and so unsafe that just giving that tip to parents, they have seen their children when they did get away, whether it was at a neighbor's pool or at a hotel pool in the water, just doing that safety ritual and routine. So again, starting your lesson with it, ending your lesson with it, and making sure at all times during your lessons, you never let a child grab for you if they're fearful or if they get into an unsafe situation. You prompt them and you guide them to the side of the pool, make a train, go to the shallow. Another um, safety tip that you will be aware of, if a, if a swimmer is really attracted to the water, and we happen to have a lot of kids that they, they just get to the pool and they wanna throw themselves in the water or they, they just, it, they cannot get satiated enough by the water. Sometimes when the kids come, we'll even add something like hands in the air, touch your toes, clap your hands, sit down, and then they turn and get in. So it adds a little bit of maybe a 15 second window in the unlikely event that the child did get away from you, from, from a mother, a caregiver, somebody's watching them, that they would stop and even do hands in the air, touch their toes, clap their hand, sit down, and then turn and get in. It just offers a little bit more of a buffer of time for them to be able to come and stop and interrupt the behavior that's unsafe. Um, yep. Last thing that I'd like to add is all of the supports that are out there to encourage safety with your child. Stories. There's videos with like Pumba and Timon doing safe rituals and routines around water. There's books that Stu Leonard put out called, called Stewie the Duck. And you can, you can find these resources and turn it into story time with your child of this is what you do when you go to the pool and make it something that they're very comfortable hearing and that they really understand. There's even music available and songs that are out there that really reinforce the principles of safety around water. So that's one thing I wanted to say. And the second thing I wanted to say is I think it's really quick to mention now that summer is approaching and parents are using floats and they get their children independent with floats. It is so important to really make an effort to point out your float is on and your float is off and never use floats all the time so that children can experience what it's like to feel the control of their body in the water when they don't have these on. That false sense of security can be really dangerous. And, and just one last thing to add to that is 
I know with aquatic professionals in general and parents really working one-on-one -on -one with the parent or the caregiver to figure out and help them for lake, pool, any water experience. You know, we do, we all, we all have our opinions about floats and we, we don't really want floats, but even something like a life jacket, if you, if they have to wait and hear the clip of the life jacket and only go with the life jacket, you have later on eight years old, not ever taking off the life jacket and then coming and needing to get the life jacket off. And it's causing so much stress and anxiety because they can't get it off. But the parent had the ritual and routine of them clipping on the life jacket and hearing it, never thinking that then it was gonna become such an issue later in life to get it off. Same thing with the puddle jumpers. They put the puddle jumpers on, they clip them in the back, they put these float belts on and clip them. We really have to work within the comfort of your swim school or your swim beliefs with the parent, with the pediatricians. There's so many views on them. We're not saying do this or do that. We're just seeing really open your mind up and really help them to understand the habits and ritual and routines and make it as safe as possible as you can for them by working with them and with open communication. Aileen, do you have anything else? No, I think we're ready to move on to our second roadblock, which is successfully going underwater. So, you know, there are the two types of kids we talked about, the fearful children of going underwater. And if you're afraid of going underwater, we see so many swimmers with autism that are in swim lessons for a very long time and never comfortably go underwater you can't really have a successful save, God forbid, in, this, in the likelihood or the unlikelihood of a drowning if you've never been comfortable going underwater. So we have a few tips on how to safely and successfully teach the anxious child how to go underwater. First tip that I'd like to give you is grading this input. For a swimmer that has um, an atypical sensory system, it's very overwhelming even to be splashed by the water it could feel like pins and needles to them. So starting with desensitizing them to going underwater and breaking it up into body parts with movement, putting the ear in the water, putting the ear in the water, putting the cheek in the water. We even do body parts, just put lips and nose in the water. And you have a lot more success with this when you do it in a safe place where the child's body feels grounded. So practicing going underwater in the middle of the deep end of the pool is not the best place to do it for an anxious child. But having them maybe sitting on the stairs of the pool, standing in shallow water, holding on to the side of the pool where they can relax their body and feel like they're in control, you can start grading going underwater successfully. So that's just one tip and I'll let Cindy give you another. Uh, along with that, if you're working to go underwater, of course you can do many home programs, right? They can fill the bathtub just half full so they're grounded a little bit and they can impose it on themselves. A lot of our kids don't know what's coming and they kind of go into fight or flight of what are you going to do to me? So if you can offer opportunity in the safe environment of their home bathtub and give the parents, whether it's sitting at a table with a bowl of water, whether it's in the bathtub, but offering some way to go under. And if you think of your body flexed and you think of your body extended, it's a little bit more calming if you're sitting at home, do it right now. When you're flexed, you feel kind of more calm and organized and in the middle. And if you try to go underwater like this, it could be a little more alerting and scary. So if you take a child at the step of the pool and keep them in flexion, then they can, you can say chin down, wipe that yucky feeling away. But this flex position is very, very powerful. So when you're working, if you're a swim instructor on going under, Many of us go under a, a million different ways, right? If you go under forward, it might not be the best way for some of these kids. If I walk backwards in the pool, the viscosity of the water is pushing my body into what position? It's pushing my body into flexion. So flexion is a little more calming. So maybe for these kids, instead of going forward to go under, when you first go under, you go backwards. So the water's pushing them into a flexed, calming position in the middle, and then they go underwater this way. It might be a good tip for trying a different way to go underwater by moving the body into flexion. 
the, the other thing, and then I'll let Aileen go, is that sometimes, I know Aileen has said this to me many times, but turn the body on so the ears can listen. Just getting in the water, jumping backwards. If you jump backwards, what happens to your body? Is it coming forward? Yeah, if I jump backwards, the water's pushing me into flexion. So even some opportunity of jumping backwards, which is helping them figure out where their body is, and then after five minutes or so of moving your body in whatever's comfortable during the lesson, and then working on going under after you warm up the body a little bit can be a good strategy. So I just wanted to add that there really is science behind these tips and these strategies. So for example, preparing the body so that you're able to tolerate the sensation of going under, we can take that one step further. And if you do some type of movement, some type of calming movement of that child or that swimmer, and it's releasing histamine from the brain. That's a neurochemical that's being released. That's a balancing chemical. And what that does is it starts to regulate their, their emotions and their body, right? After that, if we do something that's more heavy work, like maybe pushing on a barbell or a dumbbell, or even climbing out at the side of the pool, that releases serotonin and they start to feel good. And then lastly, like Cindy said, neck deep in water, when your body is safe and grounded, releases dopamine, which is a big hug, which is very calming. So here you take this situation of learning how to go under for an anxious child, and you turn it into something that's making their body feel calm before you even start. Well, of course, you're going to have greatest, greater success. And then add the tips of lips in, lips, nose in, show me lips, nose, eyes, and you'll really accomplish more than you thought you could with getting them underwater. Another um, strategy that goes along with the roadblocks for kids with autism and adults with autism kind of goes back to the ritual and routine, but it, it's a very um, individual thing. But when you think of goggles, masks, snorkels, those kinds of things, and I'm, I'm going to be honest that this happened only three months ago in, in my pool. Um, the, the mom was letting the little boy who happened to have autism, he's a little bit nonverbal, and he's been in our program a short time, and his goggles slipped, and his eyes got wet, and he panicked, and we had to get him to the side. But the ritual and routine of a goggles or a mask, if you're teaching swimming, and you always use goggles or always use a mask or you you accomplished submerging and now you've just been using the goggles and the mask for the last few months i think it's super important to remind the swimmers whether they're verbal or nonverbal, we always take our goggles off and go underwater at least one time during the swim lesson so they never forget that they can go under, come up, blink, and look so that if they fell in the water somewhere and submerged, they're not alarmed by the fact that they don't have their goggles, mask, or whatever they're using on, that they that you each time you have the lesson, at least for one or two minutes, even if there's a little discomfort, remind the parent and the child, you go underwater without the goggles, come up, blink, and look, so that you don't have a fight or flight reaction of the goggles being off. So successfully going underwater and successful saves also relates to the submerging successfully without goggles, coming up, blinking, and looking. Aileen? And then the last thing is just learning from others and having that peer model. Sometimes that's all you need when they're trying to do the activity and you have somebody that's modeling it. Look at Joey. He does lips, nose, eyes under. Okay, now your turn. Do you want me to help you do it or do you want to do it yourself? So giving them that choice, letting them have a model and even making it into a social story, especially um, the child that comes in really anxious saying, I'm not going underwater today. I'm an honest broker, so I will never say you're not doing something and then trick someone to do it. But I'll say, we're gonna go under and you're gonna be safe, but we're not talking about it right now. Or I'll do a social story. First, we're gonna do the barbell, then we're gonna swim laps, then we're gonna go under one time and you're gonna be fine, and then we're gonna get to play with the toys. So preparing, being honest, use a social story, or use a peer model. And so for any of you that have your own ways of, of going under, I ask you just to open your mind to some of these strategies. Also, if you 
If you want to print out some pictures, we're going to give you a link if you want to laminate some pictures for poolside. And, and really surprisingly, sometimes just for the nervous child, the pictures will work, work well, and you can allow them to put in when they want to go under. Sometimes they'll pick to do it right away and get, over, get it over with. Sometimes they'll put it in the end. And the, I promise the last thing I want to say is, I don't know how many of you get the parents that say, you know what, going underwater is so uncomfortable. Even when they get splashed on the face, they talked about it all night. They talked about it on the drive here. Can you just please don't put them underwater and don't work on going underwater? That's really your opportunity to educate about drowning prevention, about the statistics, and to ask them to rethink their opinion on that and see if you can come up with a different creative way to still work on going underwater. Um, I know that happens to me quite often. Uh, in fact, the boy I just saw at 11 o'clock, uh, he doesn't like to get splashed, they don't wanna go under, the parents are uncomfortable with his discomfort of under. And so I've been having them work on things at home. I intentionally splash and have him wipe face, but working with the parents on their comfort level and their discomfort and really you know bringing them the awareness of the statistic and expressing to them why it's so important that we eventually work together to have a underwater experience and because ritual and routine is so strong for some of these kids i i we have had parents that that happens too and we even have to move to a different pool to work on going underwater in a different way. So we, we wanna work with the parents when they get overwhelmed, you know, he's kicking and screaming and doesn't wanna come in here because he went under last time and listening and making some changes in our, our, our points of view together to get safe submerging. Now we're gonna to move to our third roadblock that we wanted to discuss today, which is called I Can Touch That. These are the swimmers that won't hold on to equipment, won't maintain a grasp on equipment, or might not even want you touching them and handling them within your swim lesson. And how do we overcome that roadblock? So the way this whole roadblock philosophy works is we give you some strategies, we give you some tips, you overcome the roadblock, then you go back to teaching swimming in whatever way you're comfortable teaching swimming to have success. So in the scenario of the children that won't tolerate being touched, they just don't want you even touching them, sometimes getting neck deep in the water and kind of getting that compression and having them move themselves through the water. If you think about moving in the water, the viscosity of the water, it's like moving through jello. And a lot of times that almost warms them up to then wanting to be handled. So if they're not independent yet, you can give them a noodle, you can give them a piece of equipment to support them and have them just do a few laps, just desensitizing their body before you impose touch. So, so I can't touch that if any of you are lifeguards or aquatic managers, I can't touch that also relates to a successful save because if somebody throws a float and says, take it, and the child doesn't wanna take it, we're gonna have a dangerous situation. So working together with your parents, your caregivers, your aquatic staff, when you see a child who might happen to have a wandering bracelet or demonstrating some behaviors that they um, are different and might have autism, I can't touch that is a roadblock that really relates to successful saves. The strategy providing opportunity to throw the rescue tube and have them take it to understand what it is. Even if they don't want it imposed on them, throw a kickboard, throw a noodle, and work on take it so that they take hold and propel to either where they can stand or where they can take side. And knowing that some of the kids imposing the touch on them is gonna make them go into fight or flight. So if we're in a rescue situation and we're grabbing a child that doesn't wanna be touched and that's making them more nervous and it's gonna cause more of a, a disaster, just identifying some of the soft signs to approach differently, which we do have a lifeguarding webinar that is free and it's called soft signs to approach differently. Because if we see these things, we want to be able to back away enough. Oh, wow, they don't want to be touched. Take it. I like the way you take it. Hang on, hold float. So in any way that you can practice holding something, taking something, and getting them to understand hold on and either stand where they can find the shallow or hold on to where they can take side, and then you can maybe provide a, a lighter touch in a rescue situation. Aileen? 
I'm just going to add one last thing, and it's kind of like a dance of you and your and your swimmer, because. For example, if you get into deep water and they cannot swim, they're going to try to grab you. So I will then provide the equipment and put myself out of arm's reach so they have no other option but to hold the equipment instead of holding me. And if I see they want something or they want to do something, I'll then add the language of first hold dumbbells then we get to jump in at the side and I'll prompt them from the back and I'll make sure for that whole lap they're holding the equipment instead of reaching for me using simple language first this then that so they know that we know what they want we're engaging with them but we're still getting them to maintain a grasp on holding equipment to get safely to the other side climb out. So a lot of them really, really helps. It's, it's a real life consequence. So they're able to learn from that as opposed to you forcing something. So, so for all of these roadblocks and strategies, I'm, I'm assuming that most of you are, are already doing a lot of things that relate to safety. You're doing a lot of things relate to going underwater and you're doing a lot of things and you're already seeing, oh, they don't want to be touched. So I'm going to give light touch or, oh, they just seeking hugging all the time. I'm going to give them one of those pool pets to hang on to, or I'm going to give them a deflated ball to hang on to. You're already seeing some of these things. So purposes of this webinar, I just hope that you got a couple of strategies and maybe open Open your mind a little bit to, to adding new strategies and offering parent education so that we can together overcome the statistic. And I think the next slide that we're going to move to is going to be a little video just showing kind of a, a little real life situation here. And then we're going to let Andrea take it over. I'm working on it. Sorry, it's coming. Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Perfect. So we were told at times we might have audio problems. Let's see if, if you can hear it. Otherwise, I'm happy to voice over. It doesn't sound like it's coming through, Aileen, if you don't mind voicing over. Sure. So basically what, what this mom was saying in the beginning of the video was that she cannot go to water parks. It is her worst nightmare to go to a pool party or to go to any type of facility that has swimming because her son runs from her and she can't keep him safe near water. So Cindy is showing her during the lesson ways to prompt him so that he knows when he's in the deep water how to move and get to the side safely. And we just wanted, we thought it was impactful for you to see an actual client and, and how they respond near water. You can't hear this, but in the background, there's like a water slide and it's, it's making a, a very loud gushing noise. And just the echoing and the acoustics of that water sprinkler system in there is really irritating to him and bothering him. And he won't even let his own mom touch him. Do you see? So again, go ahead, Cindy, if you want to add. Yeah, I just want to say that for some people are probably saying, well, why would you let him run like that? That this was done in a purposeful way, in a safe way for you just to see if you see signs like that to come over to the parent and say, I see that you're struggling a little, how can I help you? And allowing them just to take a breath and say, yes, I can't grab him, he's getting away from me. You know, could you get down on your knees and ask him to come to you? The parents are really hoping that when they go to aquatic parks and aquatic facilities, there a lot of times if you just say, how can I help you make this a safer experience instead of like immediately reprimanding them because she takes him swimming. He loves the pool. He does run all over. He can do structured laps, but sometimes he does get away and then she can't grab him. And in the videos, if you go on YouTube, you can actually hear her talking. She's, she's basically asking, please, please understand that I'm trying and I'm doing my best and I need help. Do you guys want the second video as well to show? Sure. Great. Okay. 
Yeah, and then we and then we'll um we can just guide people to to just go to YouTube and type in swim angelfish video and you'll see all of these with the sound. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> see if this works. So I, you, you can't hear this, correct? Correct. So what she's saying is she's getting done with the swim lesson. Koji is a bolter. He's a bolter who wears a bracelet so that the police can help find him in the event that he would, um, would bolt away, which has happened many times. And we're offering in this video in a structured way. We actually have somebody out over in the other side of the parking lot. But she's just showing that even after being in the pool and getting all this input and swimming, that she worries and that he bolts away and then she says see like this and he's getting away and running he's he's bolting out she runs after him and he's running into the parking lot and then I, i'm saying you know we have somebody that's out behind that other car over there but he always stops at the end of there but imagine living in the parents shoes for a minute because i think it's easy for people to kind of judge like, why would you let your kid bolt away from you? Um, but we have story after story of parent, you know, they are doing their best, they are with them one-on-one, -on -one, and they just somehow wiggle away and bolt. And in this example, she is bringing him back to the scene of the crime, if you will, coming back and he's making a whole statement about stay with mommy after the lesson, you have to walk safely away. But it was just to kind of show you what a day in the life of a mom might be of some of these kids that are coming to your program and their worst nightmare is that they're gonna bolt away because either they love the water or they're anxious of the water, they see something really cool in the water they wanna grab, they bend over, they fall in, and they become part of the statistic. So together we want to help everybody to feel more comfortable in inviting these parents, these families and kids and adults with particularly autism for purposes of this webinar and helping everybody become a little bit safer. Keep in mind your swimming pools are high motivators for these kids. So it's a perfect opportunity for us to decrease that impulsivity and make them slow down and make them wait before we let them enter the pool and make them ask. This is why we have to collaborate as a team with the families. This is a boy that's been in our program for over two years and he goes to two other swim programs. He has very limited language and we said, mom, come out and we do a routine actually where we put a little mat on the floor because he likes how it feels on his feet. This is the boy that puts his hands in the air, touches his toes and claps his hand. You saw that he ran and didn't do it. We asked her to let go of his hand and see what he would do. He now is an independent swimmer. He can float on his back. He always goes straight to shallow. He always finds his feet. And now he even always takes a piece of equipment. And so this is sort of the roadblocks in action, the making a child go under successful, taking a piece of equipment, finding his feet and standing up. But this is the boy that we've been working on some kind of a routine to stop him with water. Um, this is mom just saying, please everybody get some kind of a training, don't wing it, go to somebody that knows what they're doing, watch the five free webinars and help. He, he actually did wander at the zoo um, a, a year ago and they found him an hour later and he was trying to get into a car that looked like his mom's car and she is a dedicated one-on-one -on -one watching him. She's like, I, I reached down to grab something out of my pocketbook and I couldn't get him and he just bolted. Um, you see him here taking a piece of equipment. He loves to any piece of equipment that's squishy. So think of a rescue tube. If he saw a rescue tube, I'm sure he would probably take it and hold on to it. But the water for him, he's what we call a seeker. He just cannot get enough of it. And it, it, it is just overwhelming for him and it trumps any kind of safety. I hope that's helpful to watch those videos. And now Andrea is gonna give us a little bit of a summary from our presentation that we did at NDPA. 
But before that, we're just um, flashing up the actual handouts that go along with our webinars. So the first webinar is called Autism Swim that you can find on our YouTube channel. Again, they're all free. And we, again, love our acronyms. So Autism Swim, each letter gives you a tip on what to do and how to understand why your child is swimming the way they're swimming and how they're seeking that sensory input. And these free resources are for all aquatic professionals around the world to educate your staff, to have an in-service. You can print these handouts off, you can go through them, you can talk about how they relate specifically to risk management for your aquatic facility, to, to send to other people to use them and help your facility be a safe place for kids with sensory issues from the front desk to the locker room to the maybe you offer a sensory swim but these are really a lot of alien and i's work and our life's passion and we wanted to do a give back a global give back so that if we never even meet you again or see you you have good solid information to help overcome this alarming statistic because you choose to add some of these strategies to your aquatic facility This is the handout that goes with the lifeguarding, and then this is the coaching one. Um, so again, all of them have the tips, all of them address very specific things. Hope you watch them. Take it away, Andrea. Thanks guys, nice job. Okay, so um, as Aileen mentioned a little while ago, what I wanna talk about now are some suggestions from pr practitioners that we were able to gain this past April when Aileen and I, along with our colleague David Lorenzi, led a roundtable workshop at the NDPA conference uh, regarding drowning and drowning prevention and water safety for children with autism. Excuse me for one second. So we had about 30 participants at our workshop, in, and these were uh, practitioners in the field of water safety and drowning prevention, and they worked with um, or wanted to learn more about working with individuals with disabilities. So what we did in this workshop is we did a roundtable discussion, and we posed uh, a variety of questions to our participants. And excuse me. And the participants uh, kind of got together and they collaborated on some answers that we want to share with you. So the three questions that we asked that I think they gave really, really good suggestions on uh, are the three here. They gave some tips for how to handle challenging behaviors. They talked about how to learn about a participant and their needs prior to the start of a swimming program. And then we asked them for some tips on what has worked for them or for their program when teaching participants with disabilities. So look at some of the answers they gave. When we talked about tips for how to handle challenging behaviors when working with individuals with disabilities, these are some of the main themes that arose. Um, so many of them mentioned that it's important to have patience. A lot of them talked about the need for consistency. Um, and with that came some schedules, picture schedules uh, as well to communicate to the children um, in a consistent manner. There were, there's a lot of talk about um, behavior management strategies like reward systems and first then schedules. Many talked about how to avoid triggers and others talked about making sure that you're providing clear expectations and communicating with parents. Give me one second, I apologize. Sorry, okay. When we talked about uh, how to learn, how they go about learning about a participant and their needs prior to the start of a program. Many of them talked about things that they do, obviously before a program, like communicating with parents before the program. Some of these were at intake for swimming lessons and included things like phone calls or emails with parents. Others talked about uh, that they gather information on registration forms about uh, their, their child and what they need in order to be successful during a lesson. Many talked about briefing with the parents Lesson, which I think is really important, that communication with the parent uh, before the lesson and then after the lesson on what the child learned. And as Cindy talked about before, on uh, maybe what parents can work at at home to help reinforce things that were taught during the lesson. Um, many of our practitioners in our workshop talked about uh, making sure that staff are trained or prepared 
and to work with children with disabilities and how to learn about them prior to the program. One uh, answer that I thought was really a pretty neat answer that I hadn't thought of before, but one participant said that they use FaceTime and video chat between the student and parent and the instructor prior to the first lesson to be able to get to know more about the student and to introduce themselves to the students before the lesson began. Uh, many also talked about uh, kind of this triad of communication, communication not just with the parent and the child, but that they also communicated with other professionals and service providers who were familiar with the child prior to the start of lessons. So people like occupational therapists, physical therapists, and even teachers at school who were familiar with the child. Um, and this also helped them regarding learning about some behavior management strategies to work with the children during the lesson. Now, of course, any communication with other professionals should only be done with the parent or the individual with disabilities um, prior consent to provide that information. And then a topic that came up really often was making sure that you understand that parents are the people who know their children best. So going back to the parents, and really if you're having um, questions or you have issues prior to the start of the program, you wanna know about a student a little bit more, really talk to the parents because they know their children the best. And then the third topic that we wanted to know from them were some tips or strategies that they wanted to share regarding things that were successful for them when teaching participants with disabilities in their swimming programs. So I think you're gonna see a lot of the same themes actually occurring here. Uh, many talked about parent communication throughout uh, the duration of lessons. One participant had a really um, unique story where what happened was they felt the parent kind of wasn't so sure that the swim instructors were prepared to work with her child I was a little worried. So what the director of this facility said in talking with the parent is, well, would you be willing to come in and talk with our staff about your child so that our staff, our lifeguards, our instructors, everybody can learn more about your child. So the parent actually came to the facility and did a presentation um, and shared some information on her child, but also on others who had disabilities as well. That was really helpful to the staff. Many talked about uh, providing lessons in a, during a quiet time of the day or a quiet area of the pool to reduce noise and activity. Um, Aileen and Cindy talked before about peer modeling and how useful peer demonstrations can be, and that came up here as a theme as well. Our participants talked about providing one-on-one -on -one instruction or small group instruction when necessary um, for a child if they could not handle a larger group scenario, and then also providing support during the lesson if the child was included and needed a bit more support. Again, many talked about things like repetition and behavior management strategies like social stories and reward systems, the use of songs and activities. Um, another theme we saw was that participants said it's important to set goals from the beginning uh, with the instructor and the caregiver so that everybody's on the same page with what we, we want the participant to work toward and to learn. Um, scholarships, some programs offered scholarships for individuals with disabilities and for their family members, siblings as well, because swim lessons can get rather expensive. And especially when you have a child with a disability who, when parents are paying for other types of therapies and programs as well. And then um, consistency was a big thing. So consistency with the program, program time, program location, but also consistency with the instructor to try and arrange it so that uh, a particular participant always worked with the same instructor to develop that relationship and that consistency. Aileen, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say also my big takeaway was that here, we're all so invested in doing the best that we can do. We all have good intentions. We all have the passion and the desire and the love to work with this population. And um, I loved that I heard what was working just based on that. But then I got a lot of questions about, you know, we wing it or we wish there was more out there that would teach us things to do and I'm just so happy to have collaborated and I know Cindy feels the same with NDPA and with all of these programs from United States Swimming and Starfish Aquatics and United States Swimming Association and I just want everyone that's listening that's an instructor to know that we would never teach swimming if we weren't trained to teach swimming right for children that are typical learners why is it not okay to have training when we're teaching kids with special needs Training is available. It's available for free, you know, with the webinars and on YouTube. It's available for, from children with challenges. 
just to, I think it's only $40, just to learn kind of the basics about getting comfortable with diagnosis and, and risk management. And then it's available with swim techniques with the Swim Angel Fish certification. So just know that training is there and it's available and we're all great resources for each other and to work together to really bring adaptive swimming to the next level because that's what it is it's adaptive swimming not adapted adapted is like past tense it's like something we're doing to just get somebody through something that's hard but adaptive is flexible it's growing it's learning it's changing and that's what we're here to tell you is available. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing I just would like to add is I've been over the past years to so many things where people do say they wing it, or some people will say, well, I only, we only have two hours once a week that we are offering some special needs swimming, even if it is only a little. If you, if you say, you know what, there's a, a free 25 minute webinar and it will give you 14 tips and it might help your lesson. Let's do that. Let, let's look at that. If you're, if you're in a, an area that there's a lot of special needs swimmer, open your facility up and say, you know what, I'm going to offer a safe place and we're going to do a sensory swim. And in that sensory swim, I'm going to educate the lifeguards on soft signs to approach differently so that everybody is feeling more comfortable inviting these, these swimmers to our, to our places and, and understanding what the behaviors might look like. I'm, I'm just so appreciative. I, I know children with challenges, all ability swimming, adaptive aquatics, uh, and some are specific to kids with autism, some are specific to kids with disabilities or adults. Um, thinking of the gamut of it, autism, delays, discomfort, sensory issues, all of these things require all of us, even if we're teaching typical lessons, to look a little bit deeper in how we can help overcome, especially trauma and delays and discomfort and more physical sensory. So thank you so much. Yeah, awesome. So just to wrap up, some common themes that we uh, heard our practitioners really talking about, you see here. So in, across all the questions we asked, they really talked about the importance of parent communication and involvement, of learning and using some behavior management techniques, um, of the instructors demonstrating patience and flexibility when working with participants with disabilities, and then also making sure that expectations are clear. And I think that meant both from expectations of the child from the instructor, but also communication, and it ties back to the first one, communication with the parent, to make sure that the parent's expectations are being met and that there's clear communication and expectations going on between the parents and the instructors as well. So at this point, uh, we are gonna open up for questions. Um, so we've had a couple questions come in and uh, we have about eight minutes left, so we'll see what we can get through here. Uh, the first question that came in um, is, is it better for one-on-one -on -one lessons with individuals with autism or other disabilities or are group lessons more appropriate? And what has your experience been with that? You know, there's not a general answer to that. Of course, a one-on-one -on -one lesson at first to see what that swimmers needs are is, is better but sometimes you're going to be in situations where there's only group lessons available and in that in that situation I would just recommend that maybe that there's a staff person or a one-on-one -on -one person so that that swimmer can get the most out of that group lesson but I, I like private lessons when possible Good. and if I could just add on to that I think um, I think you nailed it on that I don't think there's one answer that's going to happen with every child. Every child is so different. And I think even when we look at children without disabilities, some do better in a group format, some do better with one-on-one -on -one lessons. I think it's just going to depend on that particular child and the situation and what works best for them. Yeah. Um, excellent. Um, another question came in that I think ties into this uh, question as a follow-up is how long should lessons be typically? What do you recommend and how often should those lessons occur? Well, I, I, our program is usually one, one lesson a week or two lessons a week. The intensive model and the intensive approach, like if you have a vacation week where you can swim every day to get over a certain roadblock, I feel like that's amazing and really impactful. But in reality, if we can only do one lesson a week and then have parents practice with their children or have them have the opportunity for some recreational and leisure swim in between, that's always the best. 
And our lessons are usually 30 minutes minimum, um, an hour maximum, but for the most part, 30 minutes. And I just want to add on to that, that when, when you're able to do so many lessons in a row, you're, you usually always get a better outcome, especially with ritual and routine. A lot of these parents have so much going on that it's really tricky to do that. But giving home program, like for example, if you're really struggling with getting them to motor plan the front crawl, if, if you just say, hey, could you play some crawling games? Would you crawl to and from the bathtub, to and from the dinner table this week? and do it seven days and just crawling, well crawling patterns swimming. And then they come to the lesson, you're like, oh my gosh, did you guys do the crawling? Because they're actually moving their arms so much better. Don't be uh, afraid to say, I think you could really help me to get this rollover. Would you do log rolling at home? Just put your hands over your head and clap and do log rolling both directions and talk about the pool because I really need to get this rollover so that they can then stand up and find their feet for safety. And doing things like that at home can really complement your swim lesson. And usually parents are really excited that you're giving them something to work on. Um, okay, thank you. Um, our next question, um, what should we take into account when um, designing uh, an aquatic facility uh, concerning individuals with special needs or autism? Uh, this is coming from someone who is designing a new aquatic center. I, I just want to say one thing before everybody else does. One of the most powerful tools in the water that, that I find, especially for the seekers, and I'm sure a lot of you out there are even agreeing, is is the deep pressure. So the deeper you go, the more hydrostatic pressure. And for the kids that are seeking or the adults that are seeking, or even for some of you swim instructors who like to hang out on the bottom, being able to get that deep pressure at three feet or five feet or seven feet is, an, is a nice strategy and a nice tool to have. So I, I would say I would definitely not want a pool that's the same level deep all the way across because as you get the bigger swimmers, it is a nice way to get self-regulation and to get better attention by allowing the deep pressure and coming up for a safe breath and then working on swim skills. Sorry. I also like the option of wide steps so that you can spend time sitting on a step and grounding on a step. Um, practically speaking, if, if you're able to have two pools where one of them is smaller and warmer with two different filtration systems, that's ideal because you know, we do sometimes have accidents and a pool would have to shut down. This way you have the option of the other pool, which is a warmer pool um, or a smaller kind of tot pool or kitty kitty pool. That's always great. And my last thing would be ample um, family changing areas because that's a big problem. I work in a lot of YMCAs and facilities where members get very annoyed if opposite sex parents are bringing opposite sex children into a changing room, but these parents have no choice. So more opportunity for those family changing areas would be great. And then if I could just add on, I think um, what you guys is I absolutely agree. Um, ADA compliance obviously is something that should be met regardless for people of all abilities. Uh, things that I've seen that work really well uh, in pools, especially for those kids who are sensory seekers. Um, we have one facility that we use that has uh, features like a bubble chair uh, and then like a, a whirlpool sort of area, not a hot tub, but a whirlpool and then a waterfall. Um, so those sensory seekers really are drawn to those areas if that's what you're looking to do is to attract them into the pool into those areas. Um, one thing I would consider uh, for safety and something that we've had a bit of an issue with at one of our facilities that we use is that this facility has multiple exits, not just to the locker rooms, but to outside. And that's clearly, you know, necessary in design, but it makes it very difficult for the parents, especially when you have bolters and, and children that run, um, to be able to monitor them. Because if they get out of the pool at a different section, you know, which way are they going to run and can we cover kind of all the doors to prevent them from running outside of the facility? Um, so just something to consider. Excellent point. Um, so hopefully we have a couple minutes left. I'd like to get to uh, the last two questions that have been submitted. Um, what specific training do you recommend for swim instructors uh, to work with uh, children with um, specific disabilities or autism? Yeah. So like we said, there's a lot of training out there. First, I recommend that they're trained to teach swimming first and foremost, because you need to understand regular swimming before you teach children with special needs. 
Um, Children with Challenges is a great like introductory course where you can get comfortable with diagnoses and you can get comfortable with some risk management ideas. But of course we recommend the Swim Angel Fish training because that actually gives you strategies and techniques to use in your very next swim lesson, no matter what swim curriculum you use, it integrates with it because you're overcoming a roadblock. And then you're going back to teaching within your curriculum. So it fits into every curriculum with the actual how-to strategies for success from everything you're gonna encounter, behaviors, independent, physical disorders, sensory disorders, trauma, anxiety, um, and you can find all of that information again online. Adam will post all the resources for you. Yeah, and we, we will post those resources when the webinar uh, recording goes live on NDTA.org on Friday this week. Um, and uh, I know we've had a few more questions submitted, but we're down to the last few seconds. And uh, I know Aileen and Cindy have to get back in the water and uh, back uh, to teaching. Um, but uh, my last question, uh, which is a personal question that I, I uh, in this case, want to ask, uh, you know, in each of your opinion, um, what is the most important thing you think we should be sharing with parents um, who have children with disabilities or autism and are, you know, maybe wondering if learning to swim or getting them into a swim program is the right thing for them? You know, what do you typically share with those parents? Well, can I go first? Sure. Uh, one, one, one thing is I think that parents hear so many different things and they hear of the wandering and they hear of the statistic and it immediately kind of puts them into flight, fight or flight of what am I going to do? I, I definitely have to get them safe in the water. But then they might have their own water experience, whether their child is speaking all over the place or whether they're having so much discomfort and they don't want to get in. It's really meeting them and being like, how can I help you? And I'm here to help you. And together we're going to figure something out because they didn't sign up to have a child with autism and it's a new world for them. And they know what's work and they know what doesn't. And so we have to say the words, how can I help you? I'm, I'm here without judgment to help you figure out the best way we can accomplish this. Aileen? Persistence and patience and we will all have success. Andrea, anything you want to put in there? Sorry, I can unmute. Um, I mean, I think I, when a parent comes and asks, you know, what, or when you ask what's the most important thing to tell parents, I think for any child, it's important for safety that they learn how to swim and that they're comfortable in the water. Um, but I think it's important to share with parents. Some sometimes come with maybe not the most realistic expectations, and some think that the child's going to be an Olympic swimmer, right? So um, maybe going into it and, you know, I'll, I totally believe swimming lessons are absolutely important for safety, um, but making sure that parents understand that nothing can actually drown the child. Um, so while it will make them hopefully feel better around water and the child is proficient in moving water, you know, there really is no such thing as drown proofing. So they still have to keep a close eye on their child even after lessons and even after the child is a capable swimmer. Well, thank you, ladies, um, Andrea, Eileen, and Cindy for joining us today. And I know we've had some questions come in, but unfortunately, we are out of time today. Thank you to everyone for joining us for today's webinar. And thanks to D&D Technologies for sponsoring today's webinar. Our next webinar is going to be two weeks from today on Wednesday, June 19th, again at 1 p.m. Eastern. And that discussion will focus on open water uh, rescue and open water safety with our special guest, Mario Vittoni. Many of you have heard him speak at NDPA before, and Michael Carr. Uh, these are two individuals with many years of Coast Guard, Army, uh, and Navy rescue experience. Registration inf information will be available next week on NDPA social media and the NDPA website. And also today's recording of the webinar will be available on Friday on NDPA.org. Um, I also remind you that um, you can submit presentations for the National Water Safety Conference for 2020 at watersafetyconference.org. Again, thank you for all of uh, for joining us today, and we'll see you again in two weeks for our next webinar.